Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming to the talk back. I'm Anthony McGlone. Madeline Harvey. And I'm Liz Telling. So tonight's program, you're in for a treat. Um, tonight's program is music except for one piece written by African American composers. All the poetry um, has been written by African American writers. <clears throat> The only piece that's not written by African American is the, the Gershwin, the Summertime, which, little known fact, is the most uh, re recorded song in all of history. Is that true? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's been recorded more than any other song. Um, but it is taken from the black experience, and we know that Gershwin went to Charleston, South Carolina, and studied in the Gullah Islands for over a year after um, seeing the play by DuBose, Porgy. Um, of the, of the same name and took the story. So a couple things about the composers. So you'll see that the first piece is going to be by uh, William Grant Steele. Amongst composers and in the music, he's considered the father of the Negro Symphony, meaning that he utilized African-American idioms, spirituals, rhythms, such as hemiola, um, the pentatonic and blues scales, um, in his compositional works. Um, his works have been recorded by major symphonies all over this country and the world. He had an opera pro produced at the Metropolitan Opera in 1926, I looked it up. Yeah, and uh, it was called Troubled Island and it was about the Haitian Revolution. It received six performances to great review but was never picked up in repertory at the Met. At the time, he lived in Los Angeles, where he spent most of his career, and his wife was um, Caucasian. Uh, her last name was Avery, a very established writer, and wrote the text to many songs that he set. And she was a librettist for this opera, and they were married. But in those times, married people couldn't fly together that were interracial. So they had to catch a train all the way from Los Angeles, California, to New York City because he refused to leave his wife, and his wife refused to leave him. The next composer on the list is uh, H. Leslie Adams, who is from Akron, Ohio. He is still alive. He has uh, created music of all idioms. Uh, the songs that you're going to hear tonight, uh, the Love Come and Gone is from his operetta, uh, The Wider View. Um, Prayer is a text from a collection of songs he calls Night Songs, all of texts by Langston Hughes. The third piece you'll hear for flute is uh, written by Adolphus Hale Stork, who is still alive. He's on the faculty at Virginia Tech University. He too is a celebrated composer and uses many different idioms such as jazz, uh, world African rhythms, um, spirituals and gospels in his compositional style and it has influenced a new generation of composers. The next one is Scott Joplin. Uh, the rag, and it's interesting, this rag is kind of awesome because it's not performed by the piano, it's performed on guitar. And this recording is the first recording I've ever heard of uh, a rag, especially Joplin's rags, um, on the classical guitar, so you're in for a treat. And there's dance to that, so I'm gonna turn it over to Madeline. So that part of the program is choreographed by four of our freshman dance majors. They are enrolled in their um, second in a choreography series. They take improvisation in their first semester, which is really about learning your natural movement tendencies, sort of cultivating organic movement patterns, um, testing the limitations of your body and, and what um, codified training has sort of imposed upon the bodily knowledge. And so now they're in choreography one. And this is the end of their very third week back this semester. They are so sweet. They're so cute to watch. This is the only thing I can see because I'm not playing in that. And it's a joy. It makes me so happy to see them like expressing themselves. And yes, so this this was a movement study for them um, based on, on the general theme of body, so they had to find an image that spoke to them and then create 
uh, a choreographic composition, their very first um, raw material put into space, uh, and then these dancers were chosen to be included on this program because what they had come up with really resonated as part of our sort of message and theme. So that will be the first bit of dancing that you will see to the recorded music. music. And then, should I go ahead and talk about it? Okay, so then a little later in the program, you'll see us dancing with the quartet of musicians, and uh, that is a section in four movements. Uh, my husband and I will be performing along with three dance majors who are in their sophomore and junior, and one is a transfer student. And so they have worked very frantically in the past three weeks since the start of the semester to sort of um, be integrated into this process. And, and my husband and I started the dialogue with Liz kind of back in August when we first moved to Fort Collins. And we were coming from Columbia, South Carolina, where um, the demographic of, of white and African American is much more evenly matched. We're looking at like 49 and 46 percent. So when we it's one less than one percent. Ninety-two percent Caucasian. Yes, and so when um, m when we were deciding to move to Fort Collins as an interracial couple, um, we were a little apprehensive, uh, to say the least, about that statistic on paper. So when we got here, we were so thrilled to immediately be connected with artists that were wanting to bring awareness to this and, and spark conversation about diversity. And, uh, and so we were just thrilled to be included as a part of this process. And so uh, it's such a treat to dance to live music. And I'll, I'll let Liz take over um, on those pieces. Sure, yeah, and then we'll send it back to you. Okay. <laughs> So the first, um, the first time I met Anthony was about a year ago, yeah. or, or something like You had just moved here. Yeah, and we started talking about the intersections of our, our careers and our interests. And we started talking about our passion for music and, and the way that it can speak to the community and the different, the different things that it can say. And um, we thought maybe it would be a good idea to collaborate on this project. And we originally had something a little bit different in mind. We certainly, when we first conceived of it, didn't imagine that we would have dancers as well. But then we met Madeline and Matt when they moved here. I actually know Madeline from way, 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 way back. We have um, some common friends, and so I was really happy that she moved here. We started talking and decided that it would be so cool to have dance with music, with vocal music and with chamber music in, in, in this interesting way and, and, and try to try to bring all of these art forms together to, to look at and, as she said, spark a discussion about issues of race and diversity. Um, the piece that we're doing is actually a string quartet, but I play oboe and I'm, I'm playing the, one of the violin parts, which is, which is fun. It's written by Florence Price and um, it's beautiful and it's very challenging and I'm really sad that I can't see them dancing while I'm playing, but my face is just so into the music because it's actually quite difficult. Um, do, do you want to talk about Florence Price? Yeah, I'm going to send it back over here. So Florence Price uh, was born in 1885 and died in 19... Uh, they're in the program, 1953? That seems right. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So Florence Price was a trailblazer in many, many ways. Okay, she was the daughter of freed slaves. And she was educated... Um, in the classical Western European musical tradition here in America. But in 1923, I believe, or 26, was it 26, 23? 33. Was it 33? Yes, 33, 1933. And this is so, it's interesting because to say this, what I'm about to say, and still having to say what I'm about to say in 2018 is quite remarkable and yes. shows that we have come a, a, a distance, but we have a long way to go. Um, in 1933, Florence Price's uh, symphony was the first symphonic work composed by a woman that was ever performed by a major orchestra in the United States in 1933. Wow. She also was the first African-American person, period, to have a symphonic work performed by a major symphonic organization. 
1933. So she shattered the, 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 the glass ceiling uh, two times in one stroke. Her best friend and uh, life co collaborator and uh, just companion, not in, in a, a sexual or a romantic way, but they were really good friends. They were roommates at Overland together. Was a woman by the name of Margaret Bond, who also was a prolific composer, and they have a festival for her in Chicago, and they have a festival for Florence Price every year um, mm -hmm, in Arkansas, in Little Rock, Arkansas. Yeah. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Florence Price. So her mu the, the awful thing, going back to the piece, so it's um, called Five Songs in Counterpoint. And if, if you look at the list, these are all folk songs. And you'll hear how she very cleverly uses and we most we recognize as musical gestures, Bach, the master of counterpoint, right? Anybody know what counterpoint is? No? Yes, maybe so, some people. You know, that's a bad example, but the melody <laughs> keeps getting changed and it moves around and it, it morphs. And so you'll hear that in this piece and there'll be some um, things that you know and some things you may may not know. A mama da shorten it, shorten it, shorten it, da 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 da, shorten it, bread. You'll hear that theme, and you'll hear swing low, sweet cherry. The last movie, it's a great, great work. Um, it's one of her most famous string quartets. And the horrible thing about it is that her music is slowly becoming out of print, and it's a travesty. And so now there was a great article in the New York Times. I posted. If you're on our Facebook page, you can go to um, Classical Revolution and. I posted an article about the resurgence of Florence Price's music and her coming back to be in the forefront after she's been dead almost over 60 years, um, a revitalization and discovery of her works and performance of them. So if you ever get a chance, really look, read that article. It's an amazing article about an amazing woman. It's hard to find information as we were planning this concert. I spent a lot of time, like, I spent a lot of time Googling it and trying to find, trying to find this music, which was not easy to do. Um, and trying to find recordings. There's not a recording of it. There's a YouTube video of it, but there's not a recording, even though it's quite famous. I learned another interesting thing about Florence Price um, and her um, meeting with Eleanor Roosevelt. Did you did you hear about this? She 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 wrote a piece that was a, a vocal piece with a symphonic accompaniment that was going to be performed in Washington D.C. in a hall, but because the soloist was black, they wouldn't let her perform there. And so Eleanor Roosevelt intervened and said this piece needs to be heard, and, and so they actually arranged to perform it in front of the Lincoln Memorial, oh, Mary which, which is where that was. Yep. So the Daughters of the Revolution. Yes. Oh, the Daughters. Daughters of the American Revolution did want, yes, that's what it was. That's how that happened. Well, oh, there we go. my little factoid of Thank the evening. <laughs> um, what else? So uh, colors have changed. So a couple things, did we talk about this? You can talk about doing the, the pre-speech or should I talk about it now? About how, sort of how we met the other back story. Are you gonna talk about that? After? Okay, okay. So in 2016, in August of 2016, I moved, well I didn't move here, I was, I came here to do a show um, at Midtown Art Center and uh, while I was in town, I had three, within like oh a month, three very racist things happened to me. Um, Three of my other castmates were, were African American, and we were walking down uh, Horse Tooth and College, and someone rolled down the window and said, "Hey, look at the niggers oh. here in Fort Collins." About a week and a half later, I was uh, racially and gender profiled at a bar, and was not allowed inside the establishment until someone, till the owner went back inside, carded my friend who said whose name I'd given her, and once my friend said that she knew me, um, then I was allowed into the establishment. I didn't go. And the third incident that happened to me was I was walking down LeMay and uh, Riverside, and someone hollered at me, all white lives matter, you fucking pussy, here in Fort Collins. This is September. 2016. And so I'm thinking to myself, what what am I going to do? Like, what kind of place is this? How am I going to 
continue my contract here um, and I'm not gonna be scared. So what I decided to do was I went to the city council and I told city council exactly what I just said to you tonight. And um, it spurred a lot of controversy and I got kind of acclimated to the, the city. And the interesting thing about it was I said, okay, uh, how can I use this situation to be a, a tool for education and awareness? And we don't have to agree politically, but the social, the political climate in the, in the country has also changed and been charged over the last year. And I said, okay, what can I do to kind of help things? Because summer 2016 as African American male, you know, seeing all these black men being murdered by the police and getting away with it was just more than I could stomach. And knowing that in this town, within the last five years, three men of color had sued the police because of excessive force and brutality, I was like, ooh, this is not good. So I partnered with the music district and I did a show called My People, the music of African-American composers, African-American authors, and social justice. And what this piece is, actually a couple of songs you'll hear tonight, I performed at that program and it was a group discussion. Everybody in the audience had a copy of the text. I sang and I talked about the composer, I talked about the author and I talked about what social justice issue I want. I thought that that text dealt with, whether I thought it was Black Lives Matter or black bodies in the media, black on black crime, or uh, race and gender and word association. And the audience and I interacted and had a dialogue. And I'm shopping it around to other places. So if you go to places that would love to host that, let me know. <laughs> Shameless plug. Anyway, so because of that, I met Liz and that's how we got to talking about this concert, um, Colors of Change, because as we said earlier, you know, this music is not well known, it's not part of the lexicon. Um, and it's just as good as Barber, and Beethoven, and Bach, and J.K. and, 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 and uh, Honegger, and uh, both, but it's just because um, racism exists within classic music, classical music, you know, these musicians and composers um, go unheard. They have amazing careers in, in, in Europe, but in America, it's been very interesting. And one of those composers is a man by the name of Robert Owens. Um, he's an expat. He moved from the United States to Germany and never came back. And he had a international career as a composer and also a uh, teacher of composition. And he wrote uh, a lot of, he said a lot of American, African-American poetry in German, as well as in English. So it's very interesting to see some of the scores. Uh, I think that's, I've covered everybody and everything on the program. Are there any questions from the audience? Nobody has a question? Or comment? Or comment? Oh, thank you. We're excited to uh, perform it. A lot of this music has never been performed in Colorado at all. So you are in for a treat because this is the first time it's been like the counterpoint, the, the yeah. first time here in Colorado. Um, most of the songs, maybe the Florence Price, Song to the Dark Version has been sung here, but the, the Leslie Adams and I know the Robert Owens has never been performed here in Colorado. That was so beautiful. Thank you. That was the first time I had heard a lot of that was last night. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Hope I do it justice. Um, but it's a passion of mine. And so I guess I'll keep on talking just for a little longer. I think that the arts um, play an important role in, in dialogue. Music is the great, it's the universal language, right? It's the thing that, you know, transcends race, it transcends gender, it transcends socioeconomic status, it even transcends education. I didn't grow up going to the opera or to the symphony. I grew up in a Baptist church in Detroit, Michigan. And you know, I have five or six major operating companies under my belt. And to my family, they're like, oh my God, where'd this come from? They support it, but it's like, ooh, when you, well, opera of all things. Um, and so I'm a testament to the fact that music transcends a lot of different things. And that if it's in your heart, if it's in your mind, if it's in your spirit, you can do it. Um, and the idea to use music to bridge the gap um, especially living in a place like Fort Collins when it's 
Caucasian and 8% other, you ask the question, how do we um, bridge that gap? How do we bring people to the table that may not want to be at the table? So I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions. When was the last time, and you just raise your hand, anybody had a person of color to their home for dinner? If you had one like in the last 30 days, raise your hand. One. Last 60 days. Two. Last 90 days. Okay. When was the last time in the last 30 days someone had to, do, to interact with a person of color in your place of employment? That's good. Okay, that's a little more. When was the last time you had to, you actually interacted with a person of color in a social setting that was non-work related in the last 30 days? Like I said, I only had a conversation. Like really interacted. Oh, that's good. That's better. Do you, another question, are you aware that they are the only person of color in the room? Or do you think about, does it even cross your mind? How does that make you feel? How does that make you feel? Anybody? Come on. You can do it. There's no right or wrong. It's probably uncomfortable. It just isn't comfortable. Make it. Just as as comfortable. Yes, just as as comfortable as it was for you to even admit it. Just imagine how I feel every day walking around Fort Collins. <laughs> Powerful, huh? Just as hard as it is for you to admit that, I have to walk around with it. And so we have to use music, like concerts like today, to kind of foster and, and bridge that gap. Because just to notice it is one thing. Right? But to actually have to experience it and be empathetic on some level of what that experience must be like is a completely different kind of space to be in, right? Because it takes us out of our personal comfort zone and puts us in the shoes of somebody else that doesn't look like us, that doesn't come from our same background, who doesn't may have the same religion. And, you know, the reason, part of the reason why I stayed in Fort Collins is because for me, that silence that we just experienced is the reason why I'm still here. Because hopefully, we won't continue to have that silence. That it won't be odd, that it won't be awkward, that we know what it is, but that we purposely go out and seek to engage and dialogue with those people who do not look like us. You have historic um, Latino population here in the city but there are very few in positions of leadership. Why is that? You have to think about those things. We have to think about why are they not um, in, in, in place of leadership within the government or other places here, but they've been historically here forever. They have a whole neighborhood that's being gentrified, unfortunately. Um, we, those things we have to consider. And so it's not, it's not my intention to, you know, well, yeah, it is my intention to make you a little bit uncomfortable because uncomfortable makes you kind of grow, you, you, you know, growing pains. But to make, you, to make us all think and to, to look deep within ourselves and see what we can do, our own little part, to help bridge that gap. I know, and, and I've, I have uh, come across a lot the idea that, oh, I don't know what to say. I don't, you know, know how, I don't, well, uh, this is my charge to everyone here. If it were you, what would you do? If it were happening to you, how would you respond? And that, I think, is the greater conversation that we need to have. Because at some point, it ceases to be about race. It's a human thing. I know it's not. I wouldn't accept it for me. So why is it OK for me to accept it for somebody? I have three daughters who have, um, we moved here, I don't know, about six years ago, and they're, that was about halfway through their lives. And, um, and so they've, they've kind of like grown up in this very monochromatic community, and, and they, they've been raised by liberal parents, but they don't really have that many friends of color because there just aren't that many here. And a lot of times they will come to me and go, Mom, 
is it, is it racist if, if I say this, or if I think this, or if I ask somebody this? Because they don't really have any context, and they don't want to be racist, and they don't want to say something that is out of turn, but, but there's so little context that, that they, are, they, they question like, what, what are the real divisions between the races, and what are their experiences, and what is it really like, and what is, what is okay, and what is not okay, and, and, and what is offensive, and, and what is not offensive, and is it offensive just to, to ask questions, or to wonder, or, um, and so I, I think that's a really, um, when I started realizing that they were really thinking about this a lot, it, it, um, it, it I, I didn't grow up, I grew up in the South, and um, we, we did, you know, it was, it was very, um, very evenly um, divided, not, not like here, so I didn't really have that experience. I, I knew a lot of black people growing up, but I, I don't care. Right, right. Um, Anyway, I don't know why I said that. It just it makes sense. yeah. No, I mean, I, I it's, think that, that again, that's the kind of dialogue I think that we have to have. To think. Oh, did you want to say something? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> well, just in, in speaking from a household where where we are constantly in dialogue from two different perspectives and um, a mutual sharing of trust and and empathy and compassion for one another. Um, I even find myself, you know, having to ask those difficult questions. And the, the truth be told, it, it's better to ask and learn and right. know and contribute than it is to sit passively um, and and not allow that those questions to be answered. And I think um, at, in in this program through the dance and through the music, this human experience that Anthony was speaking of, uh, exactly, it transcends race into what do we share uh, coming from in our own isolated bubbles? Where, where do those bubbles intersect and, and overlap? And where can we um, make an effort to step inside someone's bubble or let someone into our own? And I think, um, for me, in the creative process of this, that, that is really driving the, the choreography and, and, uh, and the performance of tonight's evening is sort of opening up minds and hearts to experience something that's that's outside of what you might have experienced before and being willing to stand in someone else's shoes for a second to think about how that might feel and then to allow that to shift the way that you carry yourself from here forward. Amen. Um, and, and just to piggyback, I, you know, I'm from Detroit, Michigan. Uh, and so I never, it was not until I went to the University of Northern Iowa for graduate school had I ever lived in a majority environment, right? So, you know, I grew up with, you know, Jewish children. I went to a bunch of bar mitzvahs and bar mitzvahs. Um, Dearborn, Michigan is right outside Detroit. It's the highest population of people from Middle East. Outside Middle East is in Dearborn, Michigan. So I went, to, I had everybody in high school. <laughs> um, and so when I went to, I remember when I went to, University of Northern Iowa, it, oh my God. I, the first two days I was fine, but then like the first two weeks I couldn't sleep, right? I was like, why is, it, what is wrong with me? I couldn't sleep, and so I went to go see, and I was feeling kind of anxious, and I was like, why am I, I've never felt anxious before, right? And so I went to go see a, a, the, the, one of the uh, psychologists at the school, and he asked me a series of questions. And I was like, okay. Well, have you ever been in an environment where you were where you knew you were the only black person? I said, no. He said, have you ever been in, in, in an environment where you are aware that you are the only black person? I said, no one went through something. He said, well, I think you're having culture shock. I know. I said, what? He said, yeah. Think about how you're reacting to all these new things that you've never experienced before. So we have to figure out how you're going to engage. Because like at the time, I had long hair. And it was the first time in my life anybody ever asked me, could they touch my hair? It was the first time anybody in their life had ever asked me. I had experienced, sorry, that was the first time I had ever experienced anyone asking me, uh, sir, like, do all, all, is it true that all black men can play basketball? Is it true? Um, you know, can I touch your hair? Or, you know, do you all have rhythm? Like it was, it, I was like, oh. And then I had to think of where I was. I was in a town, I was in a place that was like 99% white, but 
made a small town, those people never left. So for many of them, I was the first black person they ever, they ever had met. So then I had to say to myself, how do, again, do I turn the situation around and make it teachable and not be angry and like, why don't you get it? Because I have to get it. I have to understand your whiteness in this world. Why don't you have to understand my blackness? And that's not a bad or a good thing, it's just it is what it is. And so we have to use all the tools that we can and hopefully this concert will do that and inspire each of us here to have more dialogue to, to look inward and, and find ways to step outside our comfort zone. I'm gonna shut up talking because I have to sing. Uh, and are there any other questions or comments? Concerns? Desires to know? Yes, hold on. <laughs> comment about kids that really I think our our young population are such great examples um, that we can learn from in terms of, of um, differences and not necessarily noticing differences or making choices based on differences whether it's color or language or what we wear and um, so I, I think that's a, a beautiful thing that we need to learn from them and follow their lead I want to challenge that notion just a little bit. I think that, you know, I like being black, right? I love my, I love my black skin. I love my curly hair. I love it. I, I, there's nothing to me. I am just as beautiful as anybody else, right? And I think that you are beautiful with a lighter skin tone, um, with uh, longer hair that's a little less coarse than mine, less curly. Um, but those things that make us different are to be celebrated. And we should notice them not in ways to be like, I'm better than, or you're better than, but in ways to enrich our own existence because it's not who we are. You know, it's interesting. I mean, we could just talk, let's talk about hair texture, right? Just imagine if everybody had the same kind of hair. How awful would that be? Or if everybody, like, I was telling a friend, if, if we didn't if we didn't have like, uh, you know, Italians, we wouldn't have uh, pizza, right? We wouldn't have it. But you know, if we hadn't had slavery, we wouldn't have like good black eyed peas with hog moths in it. You know, it's just, it is really the wonderful thing about race and gender. Because I mean, we can say the same about gender. If, what if everybody was male? Oh my God, ooh, and I'm gay, Jesus, no. Um, you know, I feel that those differences are to be celebrated. They're not to divide us. You know, they're supposed to be, they're, they're the ability to bring something different to the table. You know, if we didn't have um, uh, uh, Asian, Asian influence, we wouldn't have the, the, uh, the quarter tones and semitones that we have in, in music because they have a different tuning system. Same thing with if we go into the Middle East, their tuning system is completely different. Or if we, went, if we didn't have people in Africa who thought of rhythm in a different way, so we have what we call hemiola, which is two against three. So then we can, in turn, use that to uh, influence pop music. And you hear it, you don't even know you're hearing it. So I think that, Yes, they don't see it, but you need to see it, and we do see it because, like, I know, like, you know, there are certain things statistically that, for example, like health-wise, certain things amongst African Americans is just something that, because of diet and hereditary things, that just have been passed on to generation, like diabetes and high blood pressure. It's just because of bad diet during slavery. It's just a thing that we have to deal with. So we have to recognize those racial differences, right? Same thing with me going out in the sun. Like, I don't have to think about as readily as my Caucasian friends about being in the sun without suntan lotion on. Cause like, I remember the first time I got burned, I was like, oh my God, I need suntan. Now granted, I don't have to use like a 20, like my pale friend does, I can use a five, but I know that I at least have to do that, right? So those things are, it's not, that's not a bad thing, it's not a bad thing to notice. The bad part is when we say, oh, you're better or you're worse than, and I'm better because I don't have to, and that's, where we get to issues, and we should. Any other comments, questions, answer? All right, I'm gonna shut up. I'm gonna turn over to y'all. Okay. I will see y'all later. Thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs>
happy to have you here and thankful for you to come and share this experience with us. Um, I fully believe everyone is an artist. Everyone just doesn't have access to the same resources as, as to cultivate those um, artistic aspects. So um, I am excited to share this performance with all of you artists here. Uh, and thank you to, to Liz and Classical Revolution for making this possible here at CSU. Uh, I think it's um, just a tremendous opportunity for our students and, and for faculty members to, to get to engage with the community uh, and start to get outside of our university bubble as well. Yeah. So, no, I'm good. Okay. See you in a Thank bit. you. Thanks for coming.